Amen. Well, I want to repeat what a little bit of what David said earlier. We want, we want to welcome you to Clanton Church of God. We, we thank you for choosing to spend your Mother's Day with us. Uh, we're going to take a little minute here, a few minutes, to recognize mothers this morning. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, I'll be able to, to speak more clearly this year than I did last year. I, some of you still remind me of that. But uh, anyway, uh, you know, God created woman because man was incomplete. Man could not fulfill God's will without woman and without mothers. So to start with, I'm going I'm to read a little letter that was written back in the uh, early 70s. And it's a conversation that occurs between God and an angel as he is creating woman. It said, when the good Lord was creating mothers, he was in his sixth day of overtime when the angel appeared and said, you are doing a lot of fiddling about on this one. And God said, have you heard or read the specifications on this model? She has to be completely washable, but not plastic. She has to have 180 movable parts, all replaceable. She has to run on coffee and leftovers. She has to have a lap that disappears when she stands up, a kiss that can cure anything from a broken leg to a disappointed love affair, and six pairs of hands. And the angel shook her head slowly and said, Six pairs of hands? No way. And the Lord said, It's not the hands that's causing me the problems. It's the three pairs of eyes that mothers have to have. And the angel said, is this on the standard model? And God nodded, yes. One pair that sees through closed doors when she asks, what are you kids doing in there? And she already knows. Another in the back of her head, so she thinks, sees things that she shouldn't, but she knows. And, of course, the two in the front that can look at a child when he goofs up and says, it's okay, it'll be all right without even saying a word to him. And of course, uh, as God, the angel looked at him, he said, maybe you should rest until tomorrow. And God said, oh, no, 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 I can't. I'm so close to creating something so close to myself. I already have one who heals herself when she's sick, can feed a family of six on one pound of hamburger, and can get a nine-year-old to stand under a shower. <laughs> the angel circles around the model, and she says, it's too soft. And God said, oh, no, but tough. You can't imagine what this mother can do and endure. Can it think, said the angel? Not only can it think, but it can reason and compromise. Finally, the angel bent over, ran her finger across the cheek. She said, there's a leak. I told you you were spending too much time on this model. And the Lord said, it's not a leak. It's a tear. And the angel said, what's those for? God said, it's for joy, sadness, disappointment, pain, loneliness, and pride. Angel looked at God and he said, you're a genius. Solemnly, God looked at the angel and said, I didn't put that there. None of us know how many tears our mothers shed for us. None of us will ever know how many prayers she sent to the throne room for us. None of us will ever know how many sacrifices, how many compromises they made. But what we do know is that she loved us. And she loved us so much. And at this time, I would like to take an opportunity to recognize mothers related to our congregation that have, have went on. And, 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 we, and we did our best at compi compiling this list. Um, so if there's some mistakes, 
if there's some that got left off, I apologize because despite what my wife thinks, I'm not perfect. <clears throat> so y'all will get that later. Y'all will get that one later. But anyway, here, here's a list of mothers who have gone on before and wait to see their children another day. Annie Arthur, Evelyn Barrett, Dorothy Barron, Helen Bates, Jesse Brown, Levada Burgess, Shirley Clayquer, Barbara Cody, Eunice Connell, Ida Davis, Mildred Dorset, Francis Easterlin, Gertrude Easterlin, Christine Ellison, Mildred Gentry, Edna Graves, Betty Maddox, Hassie Matthews, Lucille Maxwell, Gladys McMahon, Rita McCree, Geraldine Mims, Marie Mims, Every Minor, Nettie May Minor, Dorothy Driver Moore, Ann Parker, Marie Plyer, Marie Rhodes, Thelma Grace Rhodes, Susie Smitherman, Carrie Thornton, Nancy Alice Warren, Bessie Wendell, Lorene White, and Norma Young. I'd like for us to remember these names. I know, I know you may not remember all of them, but remember, these are mothers that are waiting to see their children once again. And at this time, I'd like to invite all the ladies, if you can, to come up here and line across the front. We have a little gift to hand out. And I know some of you say, well, I don't have children. You have been a mother to someone. You have helped somebody. You may not know, but you've been a mother. You've been a leader to somebody. So if you will, come up front, and our, our young people will hand you all out. Let's, give, let's take this opportunity to give these ladies a hand clap for all that they've done. I hope our cameramen get a picture of this group because this group of ladies, as with every church you'll go to, the ladies are sometimes the backbone, the prayer warriors of that church. And we love and appreciate every one of you this morning. And this gift that we have is just a small gesture just a small gesture of what we think of you and how much we appreciate y'all. Everybody get one? One more time, guys. Let's give these ladies a big hand. Thank you, mothers. Thank you for all you've done and all that you will do. Thank y'all.
My God covers me. Peace of God covers me. When I'm hurting, when I'm not strong, when I'm going through a storm, he covers me. Thank you, Jesus.
only in you I find peace. So cover me, cover me, cover me when I am hurting, cover me when I'm not strong, cover me when I am going through the storm. Cover me when all seems hopeless, cover me when my faith is gone. Let the peace that passes all I understand. Cover me, cover me, cover me, cover me, cover me, cover me. Hallelujah. No one but Jesus can do for me what I need. Cover us here this morning, Lord. Cover me. Cover me. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much, Jesus. I believe Jesus Christ is soon to return. I'm watching for him daily. My focus and my prayer daily is, Lord, help me to be watching for you. Help me to be ready, Lord, if you should come through the night. That during the time, dear Lord, that I'm the least alert of what's going on in my surroundings. I want to be ready. And during the daytime, Lord, don't let anything, Lord, get in my way to cause me to lose my focus. He's coming. He's coming. Oh, what a beautiful song that we have just sung. Cover me. Cover me. No one can cover us like Jesus. Praise God. It is Mother's Day. No service here tonight. We'll have this morning service, no evening service. We're working to get our Ustream up. It's a, and I appreciate Brother David mentioning that earlier. We're still streaming when we can. Uh, there are technical issues that are going on on AT&T's end and not ours. We are constantly trying to get that to improve. And so um, be much in prayer that we'll be able to do that because many of our people who can't be here enjoy watching us live uh, and worshiping with us, and we're working on that. The book of Matthew, chapter 12, verses 46 through verse 50 I will read this morning. And this little story deals with the fact that Jesus is very busy about kingdom work. He's very involved with what's going on in the kingdom. And during his involvement of what is happening with all of his surroundings, he is alerted to the fact that his mother and sisters and brethren are present to see him. So let's pick up in verse 46. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto them that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward the disciples, his disciples, and said, 
Behold my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. To begin with, I want you to understand that there was no want or lack of affection and respect of Jesus toward his mother nor his brethren. Because throughout the entire scripture where Jesus is at, he shows respect unto his mother. Remembering this, his mother asked him at the marriage of Cana to do something for her because they had run out of wine during that time. And he said to her, Woman, I'm going to paraphrase, what do you want me to do? My time's not yet come. And she turned to knowing her son respected and loved her. She turned to the servants and said, do what he says. And she just walks away. And he tells them to fill barrels of water, containers of water. Get this, they feel the water. There does not appear to be anything that Jesus touched. There does not appear to be any involvement of what he did other than what he said. He said, fill the containers and then take it out and serve it. They filled it with water, took it out and served it, and the miracle of water turning into wine. Oh, what a miracle there. There was no uh, lack of affection toward his mother. Jesus is not trying to point to that at all. But he was rather fixing his attention on those that were listening to him. When he said to them, those that do the will of my Father, those are the ones that I look at and say, these are my mother." my brethren and my sisters. Jesus is making a comment concerning that. So how great was his love for his disciples? Now throughout the scripture we are noted that we are to honor, respect, and love our mother. Now my mother, and, and of course it's fine for you to feel this way too, okay? My mother's the greatest mother on earth. Okay? That's the way you need to feel about your mother. And that's okay for you. But it's, it's, it's okay for me to feel my mother's the greatest mother on earth. Because my mother, my mother nurtured me. My mother took care of me. My mother watched over me. My mother prayed for me. My mother wept and cried when I was sick and called upon the Lord. It was my mother that sat up all night long with me, lacking rest herself to take care of me. I have a right to say my mother's the greatest mother. Because to me she is. Because she took care of me. And still did all the things that were necessary. I have a, a, a very fond remembrance of the things that my mother did. And you, I'm sure, have fond remembrances of what your mother has done where you're concerned. And so you should love your mother, respect your mother, and treat your mother with honor. For the Bible said if you want to live long on the earth... You need to honor father and mother. It's important to us to know that. So let's talk about Jesus and his mother. Mary was favored above all women in the beginning, in, in, in being a, a, a chosen or chosen as the mother of Jesus. When the father looked upon the earth, he found one that he would call the mother of his son, his only begotten son. 
So Mary was honored. The New Testament writers never indicated, however, that she was to be worshipped, prayed to, or given special titles. Mary merits our respect, but only her son merits our worship. I want you to understand that. Regardless of how good his mother was, how precious his mother was, it was important for us to respect what part she played in being the mother of Christ and nurturing him. And in case you haven't remembered it lately, Jesus had a childhood a lot like other children. He had a mother that nurtured him like our mothers have nurtured us and cared for and thought about. Note that Mary was chosen because she had found favor with God. Her humble and godly life pleased God. You see, for a mother to please God, he wants her to have a, be a humble, godly person. You want God to honor you as a mother? Then have a humble, godly character and God will bless you. And therefore God extended to her that great, great noble deed of allowing her to be the mother of His Son, Jesus Christ. Mary's blessings not only brought her great joy, but also it brought her much suffering and pain. Now, if you were to ask my two brothers, they probably say the same thing I'm about to say about themselves. I'm my mother's favorite child. And every now and then, Tommy listens to us live streaming. And that's okay, Tommy. He's my older brother. Now, it's okay for me to feel. My, my baby brother always says, Mother, he doesn't call her mother, he calls her mama. I call her mother. He says, Mama, don't you love me more than these other two boys? He'll say, I'm, ma I'm mama's favorite child. You know what I do? Yeah. I'm my mother's favorite child. You see, we carry on in this regard. You know what we're trying to say? Our mother loves every one of us. Our mother treated every one of us well. We all respect our mother and we want to do for our mother. And we know she cherished us and we cherish her. Now listen, I am privileged to have had my mother for a lot of years. My mother is 86 years old. I was privileged to have my dad. He died over 10 years ago. I was privileged to have him for some almost 92 years he lived up on this earth. I have had my parents for a long time. I thank God for them. My dad's gone on. I still got my mother. I talked to her last night. I talked to her virtually every day without something hinders me temporarily but I'm right back on the phone as quick as I can to talk to her. I will talk to her today because she's my mother and I love her I respect her and I care for her that's what the Bible wants us to understand that as loving mothers have nurtured us now being my mother's favorite child I have disappointed my mother before I've caused my mother to weep and cry. I have allowed things that were in my life early on to cause my mother to suffer. Not intentionally trying to hurt my mother, but the way my life was going. 
Hey, Brother Billy, I remember one night I heard my mother crying and weeping because I planned to go to the movies. My mother knew there was a lot more going on in my life than me going to the movies. And she was praying. I heard her through the door. The door closed, her crying out to God, don't let my son die and go to hell. My mother pleaded with me to go to church. She said, Billy, won't you go to church with me tonight? And I said, Mother, Bonanza's coming on, and I'm going to watch Bonanza tonight. It comes on during church. I heard my mother in there crying and praying. My mother wasn't bothered about me watching Bonanza. She just didn't want me to watch it during church. Why? Because she knew there was something going on in my world and in my life that was not pleasing to God. And she wanted me. See, it brought suffering to her. I'll never forget that night. I got up. I said, I'm going to church with you, Mother. I stood about all I could stand knowing she was in there praying for me. I went to church that night. Jesus got a hold of my life. I was in the altar praying. I brought what was sorrow and weeping and crying to my mother was turned into joy and happiness and tears that flowed, hallelujah, for joy. Mary experienced a lot of pain and suffering. Not because Jesus did something wrong like I did. But because the direction that he had to go to bring salvation to you and I was going to create some sorrow and weeping for her. Can you see a mother with her son beaten, ridiculed, and shamed before the multitude, broken with the lacerations, stripped to where the parts of his flesh were torn loose. Can you see a weeping mother for her son crying? See, it's kind of like our mothers that when they've seen us hurting have wept and cried in sorrow. Can you see Mary with her son being nailed to the cross and that with every sound of the hammer into the spike that either drove his feet or his hands to that cross with every one of those and with every groan that came from him. Can you feel the pain that this mother suffered from? Mary loved her son. Many people could not look. They had to turn away. Many had to get out of the way because how gruesome, how much difficulty was there. But there stood a mother that loved her son. She heard them ridicule him. She heard them mock him. She saw what they did. And yet she stood firm with her son till he gave up the ghost she loved her son godly mothers are to be commended God loves you mothers we are proud of you you see that's why that with all the sadness, the disappointment, the sorrow, and the weeping that Mary went through. That, that's why Mary's focus was important. And that's what I want to talk to us about here this morning is a mother's focus. 
Her focus was up on her love for her son. The focus was not on what he was going through. It was her love for him, her care for him, her desire to see him succeed. Has there ever been one more successful than Jesus? Has there ever been one to to accomplish as much as Jesus? Has there ever been one that his name is a household name around the world like Jesus? Oh yeah, he he has done it. A mother that's proud of her son. A mother that's proud of what he has accomplished. She would have she went through all the suffering just so that she knew in her heart of who he was and she loved her son to the very end. You see, there's been a lot of 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 great mothers throughout the Bible, and I'm going to try to just hit a few highlights, and I and I won't be here long, I promise you. But I I want to do something to share with us of the importance of what Jesus is trying to say: His love for His people, His love for each and every one of us, what God wants to do for us in life. There were mothers like Sarah, who was barren and unable to have any children and she sought every way that she could there and then her age time God gave her a son she was called the mother of many nations it was there that she cherished her son as much as any mother did their son so much so that she was willing to stand up for her son to Abraham regarding the bondwoman's son that belonged to Abraham as well, that she was a part of causing to happen. She stood up for her son. I can't tell you the times that my mother has stood up for me. And if you'll think about it, You can't count the times your mother stood up for you. Neither can you count the times your mother sacrificed for you. While I'm there, let me talk to you a little bit. My mother, you know, to me being the greatest mother. I grew up in a different day. I mean, we didn't go to the supermarket and get a a chicken we picked ours up off the yard out there, the chicken yard where we fed them and grew them, and we uh, we slaughtered them right there on the premises. We cleaned them right there on the premise, and uh, then we took them in and cooked those things and put them on the table and ate them. Now, sometimes folks think that that's that's cruel. Well, before you think that's cruel, why don't you just go down and visit one of the places to where they do the same thing when you get yours out of the supermarket. Okay? But I want you to think about this. My mother had four children. There were six of us, my mother and dad and us four children. And when you start thinking about chicken on the table, my mother always ate the neck and the back. It was one or the other. She'd eat eat the neck. And I'd say, Mother, get you a piece of that fleshly meat. My mother says, I like the neck and the back. It took me a while to figure out why she did, Martha. It's because she wanted her children to have those fleshly pieces of meat. And so she sacrificed herself. I'd like to tell you, I remember, many of you have heard, the, the story. My, my, my dad drank so much. He was a moonshiner. And my, my dad oftentimes didn't do what he should have done. Thank God he got it right in the end. But early on, he had a real problem. And I saw my mother work every day, sacrifice herself in her clothes where she didn't have the kind of clothes. See to it, I had on a new pair of jeans. I had on a pair of tennis shoes. I had a nice shirt to wear. I saw my mother work every day. And during the night, I saw her 
putting patches on my clothes. Now, it, you know, and, and a lot of times today folks say, well, oh, oh di didn't you feel uh, underprivileged? No, we, we grew up in a farming community. We all had the same thing. Everybody wore patches on the jeans. Lord, now they're putting holes in them on purpose. I, I, I read something the other day. Listen, I, I read something the other day. They're putting artificial mud on them now. They look like mud on them. My gracious, I, I probably got some stain somewhere. My mother sacrificed. I used to say, Mother, I'd like to go somewhere, but I, I know we really can't afford it. And my mother said, Son, how much is it? And I say, I, I'll see about getting a job somewhere. My mother said, well, tell me what it is. And sometimes she was able to do it, and sometimes she wasn't. I'll never forget how proud I felt. The summer. Hey, Duran, I was 14 years old. My uncle was working down at the potato shed down in Loxley, Alabama. I grew up in Baldwin County. He was working at the potato shed. I heard him say there, Heath, that, that they were hiring school boys to work. I went down there. And I went to work that summer. And I worked that summer for the entire time that they allowed me to work. And my mother was trying to get school clothes together for four children. I said, Mother, don't worry about me. I'll go get my own clothes. She said, Son, you don't have to spend the money. I said, Mother, you've sacrificed for me my whole life. This is a privilege that I have to do something to make it a little bit easier for you. Bought my own clothes. I felt good about that. I started in the summers taking care of making sure I had clothes so my mother could have a little extra. You see, my mother's important to me. Your mother needs to be important to you. And if your mother is still living, you need to cherish that and spend some time with your mother because there are many of you sitting here this morning that your mother's gone on to be with the Lord. But she's no less important to you. Because you remember her. Lord, I got to hurry. There was Hannah. Hannah wept and cried before the Lord. She went to the, the, the house of the Lord there, and it was Eli that heard her pray. Thinking because of the, the energy she was putting into it. And, and the sorrow and the, and the anguish that she was feeling, that he thought that maybe this is a woman that is somewhat drunken. And she was crying out for God to give her a child. So God blessed Hannah's call to God. I want you to understand Hannah was faithful to God and to her family. And I don't know how many of us could do this. I don't know how many of us could do it. We do it every, we, we read from it every time that we start to do dedications of children. But when the child was ready to be weaned, she took the child Samuel back to the house of the Lord and presented him to Eli and said, My Lord, that was a word of respect. She wasn't honoring him as God. She was honoring him as a man of God. I am the woman that stood before you and wept for a child. And this is a child God has given me. So today, I loan him back to God. For as long as he liveth, he is lent to God. How many of us could walk away and leave our child there? It's a mother that loved her child enough 
to put him in the presence of God's house. And Samuel became a great priest of God. He became a great leader of God. We have two books that are accredited to him, First and Second Samuel, and both of those are extremely long. And we don't know of all that is written in the Chronicles about Samuel. So much there. How could we do that? Then there was Elizabeth. They gave birth to the forerunner of Christ. John the Baptist. Lord, there's a large church named after John. Yes. There's Baptists. There's, there's Southern Baptists along with other numbers of other Baptist churches that are associated because of John. What did John preach? John preached salvation through one that comes after me whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose. He is holy. I baptize you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and power. Hallelujah. Fire. You'll be baptized with him. So he's pointing to Jesus. He's pointing to the master. She was a mother that was so in tune, a cousin of Mary, that when Mary came and was expecting Jesus and the announcement was made, the Bible said that the child leaped within his mother's womb. Oh, yeah. Precious mothers who have been precious to others. And I've already talked about Mary, and there's so much I could say about her. And then finally, there was Eunice. 2 Timothy 1 and 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that is in thee also. Now, I have to tell you in closing here, musicians, if you'll get ready with me. There were two women that were very instrumental in me being where I am today. My mother first told me about Jesus. My mother was unsaved. My mother was dealing with my dad and all his wildness. But my mother would open the Bible storybook and my mother would read to me about Jesus. I had a sainted grandmother, had 11 children. She prayed for all 11 of them. And if there's anybody made it to heaven, Grandmother Hadley's there. And who's Grandmother Hadley? She's my grandmother. Her husband was a moonshiner. And my grandmother went to church every service she could. She took every grandchild of that whole fort over there that would go with her. And she lined us up on the front pew. She sat on the very end with a switch that felt like it was as long as from here to the pulpit. That old Pentecostal church, they'd start shouting, hallelujah. They'd begin to jerk and jump. And most of us grandchildren went right under the pew. You say, well, don't you think children were scared oh I was scared of grandmother than I was what was going on because get this if we ever moved in an unfamiliar moment or time or way if we ever acted up you'd feel the lash of that switch right in the middle of church
And so every time I'd hear that switch starting to move, my head went right back under the pew. I'll never forget. That's the first time I ever saw a preacher take off running and slide like he was sliding into home. Sister Raymer, she had a defected leg, and she limp up on that leg. Brother Raymer, preaching the word, powerful preaching, Holy Ghost filled, power packed services. They take us sometimes when we have children's church, she'd carry us in there. She had little flannel boards. How many of y'all remember the flannel boards? My gracious, we got lights flashing, we got video stuff, we, we, we got so much stuff now, and, and still it's hard to keep the attention of people. Sister Raymond would get there, and she'd stand there with that leg she'd halt upon, and she'd tell us a story, Bible story, and she's using a little flannel board. Hey, I still remember today, Brother Randall, what she taught me in children's church. He said, what, what are you trying to say, Pastor? Mothers, mothers have given a lot to the church. First church I pastored, it was a small church. Rita and I went there. There was 19 people there the first Sunday with me and her. That was me and her and 17 other people. It came time to go to count meeting. Just leading up to it, weeks and months. Ladies said, Pastor, we want to talk to you. We need to start cooking chicken dinners. I was thinking, well, you know, we're able to take care of, they said, but the only way we can afford to send you to count meeting is cook these chicken dinners. And they cooked chicken dinners until they got enough money to put in my hand for Rita and I to go to count meeting. Why? Because those were loving mothers that loved God. I got to tell you, there, there, were, there were people like Violet Graves that had her own children that took Rita and I. They were young. I was, what, about 21 years old? Kind of took us under the wing. I'll never forget, and, and I'm closing, I'm, I'm closing, but, but I'll never forget one of the elderly ladies we had just moved in, and I went on to work. I, I had a job I had to do, so I went on to work. We had gotten moved in, and Rita was trying to put everything around her. And she, she couldn't get a hold of nobody. There wasn't cell phones in those days. I'm sorry. But she remembered one of those elderly ladies' names. And while she was putting stuff up, a snake crawled across the bar, across the counter. I never forget when I got home that day and Rita started describing me. She said that same little old lady couldn't hardly do anything. She was a little bit shaky, but she'd come driving up and she'd getting out of her vehicle and she got out with a hoe. <laughs> By the time she got there, the snake was already gone. But they mothered us. They loved us. Sister Watkin, gone on to be with the Lord, cooked many meals on Sunday afternoon for me and Rita. Sister Violet Graves cooked one of the best blackberry cobblers I've ever eaten. And hear, hear what I'm about to tell you. You ever eaten a blackberry cobbler with no seeds in it? It's heavenly. So what am I saying? Mothers are important. 
you mothers that are here, we love you. And this is what I'd love for you to do is to stand with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, God, for your faithfulness, your love, dear Lord, and your blessings, your support. I love our ladies, dear God. I, I love our mothers. And God, I ask you to be with them today. God, let this day be so special for them. Let us, we reflect, dear God, upon the importance of who they are for you to just bless them in a special way. For I ask it in Jesus' name.